Now I will turn it over to Bill Burnett, Executive Director of the Design Lab, to introduce today's speaker. Thanks, Annette. That was fantastic. Um, I, I'm really excited to introduce one of my colleagues in the design group. Uh, Monroe Kennedy is a pro Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering in the School of Engineering. He also has a courtesy appointment in Computer Science. He's the recipient of a National Science Foundation Career Award given you know, to a very few number of people for excellence in, uh, in engineering and science research. Um, he uh, runs the Assistive Robotics and Manipulation Lab, we call it the ARM Lab, which is a lab uh, dedicated to developing technology that improves our everyday lives by creating intelligent robotic systems that can both perceive hum the, our, our environments and figure out uh, what humans are doing in these environments so that humans and robots you know, can uh, work and live side by side. Um, uh, Monroe's lab will be one of the labs we tour uh, if you come to the Emerging Technology um, Workshop that's coming up in March, but we're super excited to introduce him. Um, he's got a fantastic uh, uh, presentation here on can machines understand human intention? Can machines even understand anything, I guess, is, is an interesting question. And in the, in the world, in the, in the modern world of AI, ro robotics, autonomy, and other, other kinds of robotic systems, I think this is really one of the most interesting topics. And then we're super excited that we have a chance to bring it to you. Um, uh, Monroe, um, why don't you take it away? All right, thank you both for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you today. Uh, so as mentioned, um, I direct the Assistive Robotics and Manipulation Laboratory. Uh, and one of the guiding questions that we have is, uh, what comes after robotic autonomy? Uh, so if you think about robotic autonomy, that's the ability for a robot um, to be in an environment, to understand itself and its task, and be able to complete that effectively. Uh, but what comes next is thinking about how that robot might need to team with humans or other robots. Uh, and to do that effectively requires modeling um, those human teammates. Um, I have this figure here um, shown on the left that outlines how collaborative robotics fits into this larger conversation of robotic autonomy. So uh, when you think about the principles of robotic autonomy, a robot needs to be able to do three things. It needs to be able to see, think, and act. Um, formally, that's perception. How do you observe the, the world through a camera, through the sense of touch, or other mechanisms, other sensors, and reduce this down to a state, which is a collection of variables that change. And based on observing their change, you can say something about how the world is evolving. And then given what you observed uh, in your environment, how do you plan on what you want to do next in order to uh, achieve some objective? And then how do you control? How do you actuate yourself? How do you move? How do you uh, provide some input that changes the state of the world? So that's the see, think, act, perception, planning, and control. Uh, in the larger context of how robots might be teammates, some of the perception may include uh, observing humans in your environment. So how do you estimate their intent? Uh, so something that's very popular nowadays are language models. Uh, and that's a very um, uh, uh, adequate way to obtain intent from those around you. So perhaps I can speak to my robot and say, hey, can you pick up uh, this cup of water on the table? Uh, and maybe that is a, a valid form of input. But uh, in my lab, um, and I think another interesting question is when things have to move very quickly, it's sometimes not always efficient to have to use sentences to describe what you intend. And I would postulate to you that when humans work together, we also don't always use language. Maybe we use it a lot, but we don't always use language uh, to convey our intent. And uh, one of my favorite examples is particularly in sports. So if you have people working together uh, in sports, uh, you know, take soccer or basketball, they spend a lot of time working together, practicing. Uh, so they understand, again, how they want to achieve their objective, like scoring a point, but they're very familiar with the abilities um, and the signals that each other are able to, uh, to convey. And so given the abilities of your teammate, you can exploit that to actually, for instance, score a goal. And so the ability to understand your teammate, to be able to predict them, to be able to read them, 
is crucial as a tactical advantage um, in sports. And this notion of how do you estimate what your human teammate would need if you're a robot is what we're trying to capture. And we need to express that mathematically. And that's what we're going to get in today. How do we express that mathematically? So I've, I've highlighted here on the left-hand side um, uh, three of these uh, main points in red, which we'll touch on in more detail. The intent estimation, how do I observe a human and pull out a state that allows me to estimate uh, uh, the variables that are changing? How do I use that state and knowledge of the tasks that we're trying to do together to predict how my actions may influence the human and how their actions may influence me? Uh, and then with that prediction, how do I choose what actions I should take that will lead to um, a, a better outcome for the overall team? So to start this conversation off, um, we're going to build uh, some tools first. We mentioned how do we need to mathematically model uh, the ability to estimate intent. Um, there are a few ways to think about this, um, but the most popular way right now uh, is through something called a generative model. Uh, this is not necessarily a new concept. However, some of the tools um, that are uh, used to calculate it nowadays are very hot uh, and, and uh, very capable. And to start off here, um, I want to begin the conversation with um, a tool that most of you are probably very familiar with, uh, ChatGPT. So um, I'm sure we've all had a chance to try this out. You can go to ChatGPT, OpenAI, uh, you can put in a prompt, and you can get a very good um, personalized response um, that most of the time uh, is pretty much on point. Um, with what you might have uh, inputted um, as, a, as a query. So here uh, is an example I've put in here. How could humanoid robots help society? What are the biggest challenges for robots doing everyday tasks? Uh, and uh, some of these answers I completely agree with, um, highlighted here on the right. You know, you can uh, provide assistance for those with disabilities. There's healthcare, manufacturing, manipulation, and, and perception are the challenges. Uh, did a very good job um, of, of pulling uh, that answer. Very realistic, you know, on point. Um, beyond that, you might see applications uh, for actual technical assistance. So let's say you have um, a wearable sensor uh, where you want to use an iPhone to do some sort of pose tracking of a camera as you walk through a particular space. You can ask how you might use um, camera data from the Swift, which is the coding platform for Apple, to stream that to a computer that you might connect with other robotic components through Linux and ROS. Uh, and then you can see that this can give a really good um, uh, output um, that, again, is typically about 80% correct. So if you kind of know this general coding structure, this can really get you moving in the right direction quickly uh, in order to um, begin implementing these strategies. And of course, with uh, GPT-4, you have the ability to take a picture um, of some um, website uh, and, uh, or, or input, and then it can actually take a picture, a rough idea, and correlate this here to actual HTML code um, and other things like this. It can use images to also generate text. So uh, what's going on under the hood here, and what are some domains for this type of generative modeling? Uh, so some of the examples I've given you just now uh, include text generation. You put some text into this model and text comes out. Um, diffusion image generation, you can put text in and an image may come out. Uh, and even um, uh, music, you can put in music signals and music uh, will actually come out with these different um, tools. But before we get into them even more, um, I'd like to lay a very high level, quick mathematical foundation. And I find that this example here um, is very uh, digestible. So I would like to you know, um, uh, invoke your imagination. Uh, imagine you're a fisherman, and you're trying to determine uh, where you should sail your boat uh, to find some fish. And you uh, notice from past experience uh, that it might be helpful to determine uh, where the birds might be flying to actually drive your ship to that relative location. So here on the left, um, we see our birds. I'm going to call them an event X, the presence of the ver birds. And the, the, the fish that are under the water will call this variable Y. Um, and our goal is to determine the relationship between the fish under the water and the birds that are in the air. So um, uh, please excuse the fact that this is all on one slide. Uh, but if you go to the very top line here, we have this P of Y and this 
this upward line and X. Uh, and this is telling us uh, what is the probability that we will see the fish given the presence of the birds. And we'll call this a posterior probability. Um, and we can find this if we know a few things um, statistically. If we can say from prior observations, we've seen uh, in past data, past experiences, that when there were fish, how often were there birds? Uh, that will give us P of X conditioned on Y. What is the likelihood of birds given there were fish? And then if we have some fundamental knowledge of the species, so what is the probability that the bird species is gonna be in this geographical location given this time of year? Have they migrated or, or what's their likely presence of being there? Because there could be fish and no birds simply because the birds have migrated. And likewise for the fish, there could be birds, but if the fish migratory patterns uh, are known, then we can use that knowledge as well. And this leads us to a, a very fundamental equation in machine learning, which is Bayes' theorem, where effectively we can use this prior information about how uh, birds and fish relate um, and the uh, fundamental knowledge of those species to then calculate um, this posterior probability. What is the likelihood of seeing uh, fish given there were birds? Now, I won't get too mathematical on you, but I wanted to give this uh, foundation so that you kind of have a handle when we talk about these tools. And Bayes' theorem is extremely powerful, as is statistics generally, because it's the art of, of, of effective guessing. Another uh, uh, quick uh, intuition I want to give you here um, is this idea of do we expect a single outcome or potentially a distribution of outcomes? So here on the on the left hand side, let's say we were we had a bucket that was just sitting outside, um, and the only way this could fill up is if there was potentially rain. Uh, so if there is water in the bucket, uh, then we can um, assert that uh, there was at least at some point a cloud that filled it up. However, uh, on the other side, if you look on the right-hand side of this image, if we see a dark cloud that potentially has rain, and I were to ask you, what is the likelihood that this bucket is fill, uh, filled or not? Uh, well, you have a 50-50 chance. Um, has it begun to rain or not um, uh, to fill this bucket up? But given this cloud, statistically in the past, you may have seen that this could have 50-50% led to um, some outcomes. So you have this distribution of outcomes versus a single outcome that you can infer. Um, and a lot of machine learning, uh, machine learning principles uh, may rely on one versus other paradigms of thinking, depending on what you're trying to do. So perhaps you're trying to learn a relationship between variables where you say, if I had this outcome or this variable X, what is the likelihood that this other thing happened? That's a regression model. Um, but if I want to realize that there are multiple things that could come out of this, a distribution, um, that's this more stochastic, uh, stochastic uh, uh, representation that I might want to, to capture, which you see here on the right. And both of those are useful depending on your task. So to kind of, again, uh, build some idea of what, uh, uh, an idea of the tools that are actually used to do this in the wild, um, I highlight these four types of models. Uh, one is a probabilistic graphical model, an autoencoder model, a generative adversarial network, and flow-based models. Um, the takeaway for these um, that I want you to have is there's this variable x, um, shown usually in green here or blue, uh, and then this variable z. And what's happening here is this X is some observation of the world. Um, it could be you know, a camera image um, or some other data. And you want your model to understand the key features of what uh, that information um, encodes. And you take uh, an encoder model and you compress it to this what we call latent space um, or the code, and that's Z. And this is an efficient way for the computer to think about some underlying relationship. And you use a decoder to then say, how do I go back to um, some representation of that state X prime, where I've pulled out the key features to understand um, what was important? Um, how do I uh, purport, uh, perform salient feature uh, extraction here? And so again, it's saying, I'm given the raw data, I compress it to what's key and essential, and then I can decompress it um, uh, back to um, what was useful, the big takeaways that I wanted to have. And so these are different ways to do it. 
um, and we'll talk about um, some of these a little bit in more detail, but the goal is really to just give you, again, some, um, some knowledge of the jargon that's used in this space to accomplish these types of things. So what's under the hood? Um, so the ChatGPT, which we all know and love, uh, is using called, something called the transformer. Um, and thinking back from that last page, there's three main components there that are going inside of it. There's a variational encoder, uh, recurrency, which is allowing you to perform a sequence prediction, and then attention, which is telling you what's the most important thing um, in the sequence of inputs that you should be paying attention to. So I first want to bring your attention to this middle uh, 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 image here. I like science, um, and the goal is to transform this into German. So you have an encoder that is able to look over that sentence, um, compress it into a code, uh, and then um, uh, with a, a, a tag, um, output this uh, translation in German. Uh, that's the uh, sort of variational autoencoder structure coming into play. What's the most important piece here? How do I compress it? And then output it into this other language where you would have the decoder related to, for instance, German or whatever other language you would want. Recurrency says, you know, what kind of sequence, how does the past words influence the future? Um, so, you know, the boy rode his bike to the park is highly likely because of the fact that you had those words in front. The boy rode his bike to had high likelihood of a destination being an outcome. That's the recurrency. Attention means maybe not every word that you was spoken, the boy rode his bike, maybe just boy, road, and bike were the most important things you needed to actually infer what came next. So attention says, what are the most important things in the sequence I should pay attention to, to infer a particular outcome? Another is this idea of diffusion. And so it says, I can have a relationship between a very crisp state, so here shown in this middle uh, right, x naught, and this relationship of noise. And the name of the game is to think about how I could make this noise, these variables that are... Uh, 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 positions that are random in position, how can I make them converge back to a salient state that actually makes sense? So he, here you see this noise condensing back to this S. And the name of the game here is if you think of all of these points, think of them kind of like sand, if you had like a sand shaker, how would those sand shakers move back to their relative positions that would actually allow you to reconstruct an S? And so the modeling here says, how should every point move along that space, along the plane, to get back to its relative position on the S. And whatever you condition on determines the shape of the ground that would make that sand particle move back to its position in the S formation. And that's what you condition on. So in this uh, example for text to image, I say, you know, pr produce me a group of, of uh, robots playing the violin and then given that as a text input, it then determines how to take no a noisy image and condense it back into a salient, realistic looking image um, that captures uh, what you conditioned on, which was the text. And again, there's this latent structure that's coming into play um, that describes the gradient of how those noise particles sh should conform to give you back a salient image um, uh, in, in this form. Another example here uh, is music generation. So same idea. I can uh, put in a signal here, um, here the beginning notes of a song, and then I can say, you know, given all of the music I may have exposed this model to, what do you think should come next? And again, um, perhaps elements um, of, uh, you know, features of this song are being pulled out to actually help you extract and reconstruct similar um, out, uh, um, output music. So uh, I think a very important question here, you know, we see these tools and we wonder um, how powerful are they, right? Is this the dawn of, you know, like true machine intelligence? Um, and I think these tools are very powerful, very useful. Um, but I think a very important thing we need to keep in mind um, and what may actually, I think, still differentiate in some ways, you know, what humans are able to do versus robot is this idea of, of original thought. Um, and so um, I'll postulate this example to you, and then I'll, I'll, I'll make it more high level and intuitive as well. 
So um, again, uh, please excuse the fact that everything's on the slide at once, but uh, imagine I had um, a sine wave uh, here. So X is your input, Y is the height of the wave. Um, and the blue region you see here is all you originally exposed your model to. So um, over this span of 20 points, the sine wave uh, doesn't drastically increase um, in its magnitude. It's increasing fairly slowly. Um, so, you know, it would be a perfectly fair assumption to assume in the blue region that all you would need to predict the Y um, is just sine of X. However, um, clearly we can know with our, you know, external view here uh, that uh, that's not a complete uh, view of how this model um, would behave. And in fact, um, it would be better um, to actually be able to extract further to have something that would predict um, points that are far outside of the region you were trained in. Um, and so this is the challenge, right? How do you say, you know, if I expose my ChatGPT model to a bunch of verbal examples, the internet as it exists today, and I go create something new, it can interpolate what currently exists but if I say create something brand new, um, it won't be able to do that. So the very easy example I put here in the bottom right is if I ask my uh, ChatGPT prompt, you know, what's a compact or portable fusion reactor design? Uh, it'll throw its hands up and say, I don't know. Now, does that mean that this is unknowable knowledge? I don't believe so. Uh, we can look at like Lawrence Livermore and the advances that they have. I'm confident in the next few decades, we will see a solution here. So. If there's if all of the knowledge to do this currently is existing or being built uh, or could be built up by us, why can't ChatGPT do this yet? And it's because it's interpolating from what currently exists and it's not extrapolating beyond the training set, beyond what it was exposed to. So how would we achieve that? Um, what are some high level thoughts that it would take to actually do that? Well. You know, to achieve this, you have to be somewhat self-aware and say, well, uh, even in the region that I'm exposed to, um, how do I make sure that I'm doing a really good job of explaining that behavior everywhere? And maybe for some parts that are really far away, if I could gain access to those components, could I make my model uh, actually uh, perform correctly and predict those things that are very far away? Um, I have a passion for physics, so I love to use this particular physics example um, how, you know, even aspects that um, physicists are able to do to uh, explain, uh, you know, features very far away. Like, you know, a few years ago, we were able to get our first picture of a black hole. It took the entire planet coming together to effectively create a camera that literally spanned the planet to get this picture of a black hole. And the equations that describe this were those that described things on a smaller and smaller level. So we go from Newton to Einstein to even smaller uh, uh, equations that are more compact, that as we understand our universe in a more fundamental way, actually extend and allow us to make predictions that are even further away like a black hole. I use that as analogy here. Uh, if I were to look at this sine function and I were to say, okay, I want to have a description that is accurate everywhere. I need to um, be able to model the most compact form of this, uh, of this equation and have it be applicable, have it be accurate even far outside of domain as well as within domain. And so uh, I believe the, the path forward for that is actually models that understand contextualization and are able to modularize their components and play them out and understand how they would affect each other, how they would behave even far outside of the domain they were originally exposed to, which is, I would argue, how we conceptualize things. We think about concepts, we form hypotheses by saying how these concepts should play together, and then we test them. That's the scientific process. So um, changing gears a little bit here, how should we, uh, what should we consider uh, when constructing a model? So here I've, I've drawn a simple uh, pendulum on a string here where the pendulum uh, has some mass and it's moving back and forth. It makes some angle theta with the uh, ceiling. Um, and you can think of the state, the most efficient way to uh, represent the uh, changing variables of this uh, pendulum as the angle and the angular velocity. If I have a camera that's looking head on at this pendulum as it swings, I could try to extract the state um, from this image. And so the key 
uh, uh, relationships that I need to be aware of here uh, include the observation. So if X is my image, this is what I'm observing and I'm trying to um, uh, predict uh, and understand that relationship, I can say, how is my image uh, dependent on um, the current state, the theta, theta dot, and if there's any actuation, if I have a motor or something that's uh, forcing some motion, uh, causing some action, how is my output image related to those variables? I can talk about the dynamics. How do things change? How do I expect the uh, position and uh, velocity of this pendulum to change conditioned on the past position um, in any action that was taken? If there is a decision maker that's changing the state of my system, what's driving their actions? And this is in the machine learning uh, community known as a policy. Um, in the like analytical controls area, this is um, a controller description. And so um, I represent these in a probabilistic framework because it's a sort of catch-all framework, whether you're dealing with analytical equations or even um, different types of representations. And so this often falls into something called um, a Markov decision process or a partially observable Markov decision process, which describes how a state changes and everything that uh, may contribute to that change of state and how you might observe it. The other key uh, thing here is when you begin to try and think about distributions of outcomes, um, you literally have a statistical representation here, like a Gaussian. And so if I have this uh, shown in the middle here, some P of theta, which represents my model's distribution, and I had some training data that I exposed you to, uh, which is this green uh, Q of psi, um, the goal is to match these distributions. And again, let me ground this for you. Um, imagine um, I have uh, a person that's driving around a track and I wanna do a, a physical Turing test. Um, I want you to, if, if you're in the stands, I want you to tell me if a person is driving that car or if a machine is driving that car, um, how would you determine that? Well, perhaps if you watch the person, um, they're super efficient at this, they do some drifting, but you notice that their motion is not exactly perfect. While they're fast, the motion that they, they perform is not exactly perfect. Whereas perhaps if I showed you a machine driving around the track, it would actually look like it was flying by a wire. Perfect execution every time, and that's how you would determine that a car or an autonomous vehicle was actually driving on that side. So if I wanted to fool you, the task I would have would be to add enough noise to the behavior of the car so that it would mimic that of a human so you couldn't differentiate between the two. And so this is just an example showing how distribution itself can be useful for um, mimicking um, aspects of behavior. So uh, with that, um, I'd like to kind of move into uh, more specifically, this idea of teammate prediction, and then tie this into some of the work that's uh, currently being done in my research lab. So some questions we might have when you think about um, robots and humans um, working together is how do they conceptualize each other? So here uh, in this cartoon in the center, I've drawn, drawn this image of a robot thinking about the team. Um, and it even has a little thought cloud for the human. Um, this is formerly known in my field as a, 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 a theory of mind of the first and second order. The first order says, I just conceptualize uh, myself and my teammate. Second order says, I'm also trying to think about what my teammate is thinking about and use that to help me make decisions and plans. So um, here are four big questions you might ask yourself in this space. You know, do agents share the same goals or, and objectives? Who, if anyone, is in charge in the team? If the robot is predicting multiple partners um, and their future actions, how can this be done efficiently? And where does task domain knowledge come from? Where did you learn to do the thing we're asking you to do? Again, our trusted tools come back to play. Uh, here we see the conditional variational autoencoder, uh, generative adversarial networks, flow-based models. All of these uh, can be useful tools, among others, um, but these are very popular right now. Uh, all of these can be very useful tools to try and infer 
and predict human behavior given the exposure to their past behavior as your training data. So I watch a human do something for some period of time, I collect these observations, and then I'm trying to statistically match that distribution so that my robot can predict um, with some likelihood what might happen next, realizing that teammates are stochastic, so we don't expect to get perfectly right every time, but we want it to be very close within distribution of what uh, the teammate might do. Uh, this uh, provides a very um, a nice description, too, of how this might work um, in a formal framework. So here you have this robot and human team. They share a mutual goal and objective. They both are able to take actions on the world or the task. This, a cause, this causes the task uh, to change. Um, and we can measure this in terms of some sort of state evolution. The agents, um, human and robot, would observe that change, and that would in help them infer what future actions they should take. And we're postulating here that if the robot is able to conceptualize all of these components, the objective, the policies for both agents, how the task will evolve, and how both agents will perceive the world, then the robot has a chance of rolling these things out um, in the future in its mind and saying, how does this maximize some measure of benefit or reward? And then I can then say, if I think of this stochasti uh, stochastically, I could look at many different sequence of action pairs and then determine uh, what action I should take next that maximizes some potential output, allowing me to be a better teammate uh, with the human. So now I'll, I'll quickly show you a few examples uh, in my lab that demonstrate this. Um, I have a few videos um, that won't play through these slides, but if you go to my website, arm.stanford.edu, under research, you can actually see some very cool videos for all the things that I'm telling you uh, right now. So um, in this domain, um, this first problem we had was thinking about how a robot could substitute um, and serve as a teammate alongside a human. So um, the concept is shown here on the left. So we have this robot that ultimately wants to help carry a table with a human. Um, and what it does is in this sub thought cloud, you see this A box, it's able to observe two humans work together. So we expose it to data where humans work together extensively. And from that, it says, okay, I'm in a very similar situation to what I saw two humans in, what would a human do? And it uses those statistical models we discussed to understand all of the possibilities that it was exposed to given a similar placement that it's experiencing. And after planning and looking at all of those potential outcomes in uh, part C, it can say, this is going to be the outcome I'm going to pursue most because I think it will maximize my reward of getting close to the goal quickly without striking one of these red obstacles. Uh, shown here on the right um, is the uh, methodology um, by which my uh, graduate student Eli Ng achieved this. Uh, so here, the observation buffer is all of the human-human data that we collected, where humans played this game together in a simulator. Uh, we then compress this into a variational recurrent neural network, which outputs motion predictions, expected paths that are similar to what humans demonstrated for us. We then select what we believe to be the optimal path, given the distance traveled and other parameters, and then uh, we tell our robot to execute that path alongside a human, um, and we observe the outcome um, of that uh, shared trajectory. And so um, we showed in our work that if you compare this to um, RRT, uh, which is a way of saying, let me just explore random paths and try to make sure none of those random paths I roll out don't hit any obstacles and eventually reach my goal, compared to this method that's informed by what humans demonstrated for you, we're able to show um, that um, the VRNN, um, our method, actually produces much smoother outcome paths um, in the end. Additionally, um, you might say when you're doing this task, uh, maybe you followed uh, um, an efficient path, but how do you know necessarily um, that they were more collaborative than if they were to pick random paths that didn't necessarily hit an object. One way to think about this is through something called interaction forces. And so if you were playing tug of war, tug of war is literally a game of inducing stress in a rope because there's disagreement. 
one team wants to pull the rope to one side, the other wants to pull the team to the uh, the rope to the other side. There's these really large tension forces inside of a rope in the game of tug of war. Um, however, if I were to pick up an object in my hand, um, perhaps I am applying some forces just to localize it, but I might not be squeezing this with all of my strength because there's agreement between my fingers on how I actually want to move this object. So uh, one measure that the field has agreed upon is this notion of interaction forces. How much stress or compression are you applying to the object you're carrying, um, and how can that be used as a measure to measure consensus between the agents involved? And so what you see is um, if you have two humans carrying something together, the interaction forces are low. They're not zero, but they're low. And um, if you use our VRNN, they're also pretty low. If you don't and you use the sort of random path planner that shouldn't collide, um, you'll see that these interaction forces, the tug of war is quite high. It was hard for the robot and human to reach consensus. Another really cool aspect here um, is this notion of the Turing test. So we did this experiment where we said, okay, we're gonna set up a barrier and we're gonna have a participant uh, work with um, this simulated uh, partner in the carrying task. And we're gonna have them do a bunch of trials. And in some of them, they're gonna be working with a robot and others are gonna be working with a human. And we wanna know if they're able to correctly identify who they're working with based on the behavior that they experienced as they played the game. Um, and so what you see here on the bottom right are the results from that experiment. Blue is the sort of random um, uh, uh, path generator, which we don't expect to succeed very well. And VRNN was our method that was informed by watching humans work together. And um, this uh, x-axis um, gives you um, what the human thought versus what it actually was. So if they thought it was a human and it was a human, they got that correct. If they thought it was a robot, R, given that it was a robot, slash R, then it was correct. And what we saw was with our method, we actually did a decent job of confusing people um, when uh, we actually um, had uh, the VRNN system. And this is just a violin plot. So this says all the data that we took, what's the distribution of that um, in case it wasn't unimodal um, and you'd like to see the true distribution. Um, my student extended this work and I encourage you to again, check out her really cool video where we actually said, now what if we used an even more advanced uh, method to in capture and model behavior? Um, and so for that, we used a diffusion co-policy. And it turns out that when we expose this diffusion co-policy to uh, examples of human data, and then we transported that to the robot, the robot began to exhibit um, very interesting high level behaviors. Um, in particular, some that you'll see in her video includes the ability to serve as a leader and then transition to a pivot to then become a follower so that the uh, table could efficiently navigate um, the obstacles. And when we saw that, that made us very excited. Another project I'll quickly mention um, uh, in this space uh, uses the same type of tools, but applies it to a completely different domain. Um, and that's the intelligent prosthetic arm. So in this instance, imagine, you know, someone has had a shoulder disarticulation, so they don't have their entire arm. And we want to endow them with either a, a prosthetic arm or a teleoperated arm so that they can do complex manipulation tasks again. There's two ways to think about this. One where you say, well, we know all the tasks they might want to do, like drinking from cups, picking up a fork, and then there could be an instance where you need to teach them how to do a novel thing. How do I teach you how to, um, how to move the hand in order to complete a task? And it turns out that this same type of framework where you say, given um, the tasks that are uh, there, how do I extract their intent from their gaze? If I have them wearing a headset, what are they looking at? I could use EEG, intracortical, to understand their brain waves, how that might give me an idea of what they want to engage with their EMG, so must any muscle actuation they're able to provide, how can I condition on all of these inputs, be them limited, in order to control um, a high degree of freedom um, uh, uh, arm. Another I'll mention to you is this fall prevention wearable sensor. Um, so in this domain, uh, we think about uh, particularly uh, what might lead to imbalance um, in a person. 
And it turns out that this is um, actually a leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries in older adults, those who are 65 and older. Um, and the question we had is realizing that uh, falls can be, can be caused by internal things like illness and psychological factors, but they can also be caused by external things. So if they bump into something or something bumps into them, um, we're saying, well, what we can do right now is think about those external factors and particularly how they're walking in an environment. So a passive perturbation, you're tripping over some steps, you're bumping into a wall um, or something. Can we understand, given how you've walked and watching a whole bunch of people walk, can we predict how there are features in your environment that might potentially lead to um, imbalance? And so my student, um, he made this initial wearable sensor that's able to, uh, includes a camera that's mounted on your torso, um, IMUs that are located on your legs. And the idea here uh, is that using these, he can observe the environment um, in order to use a machine learning model to accomplish this. So now we're back to our problem statement. And while we'll use some fancy models to accomplish this, it's very useful to, to formally say what our state is, and we can represent our objectives in a probabilistic manner. So here, our state includes what's the pose of the person? Where are they in space? What's the velocity of their torso? If their uh, motion of their torso, if they have some natural sway and cadence, can we actually predict that sway, that cadence, um, and then um, monitor that change in case that might inform us about potential imbalance? Can we watch uh, their step frequency and the joint angles in their legs? And so these two probabilistic statements says, um, given how they've walked so far and the environment, can we predict where you're going to walk in the future? And given what we've seen so far and where you've walked, can we predict how the environment will change around you? So the first challenge we had um, for this was how to represent the environment in a way that a neural network could digest and use for prediction. So for our first step for that, we used this uh, sensor that was mounted on the torso to collect images and depth images um, from our surroundings. And what we did was we created a panorama. So if you see this person in the middle of the screen at the bottom, there's the cylinder that encapsulates them. You can think of this as a, a cylindrical image where the red line can be cut and opened up so that it becomes a rectangular image you see in the top right-hand side. So whatever's right in front of you is a small area right in the center of that image, which you see as the second row image um, on the right. And if you're walking straight ahead, um, then that's the red path um, drawn in this image where your feet are at the bottom of the image and then you would walk up in front of you based on what you're able to see. And so this was a way that we could actually efficiently represent the uh, obstacles around us um, uh, in order to um, uh, provide that information to our model. The other thing was the notion of sway covariance. And so it, by watching the motion of our torso, we learned um, that in fact, uh, when someone is perturbated, um, if you watch the statistics of how they're, if you had a, a Z axis pointing up straight up and you project it into the ground plane, um, there's gonna be some natural uh, motion that makes this sort of ellipse, this covariance. If someone's perturbated, this ellipse grows very sharply. And that growth can be useful for predicting that something caused perturbation and perhaps that might be uh, something that would cause you to fall. So this is our machine learning model um, that we ultimately ended up using to perform this prediction. Um, so don't get overwhelmed by the details. I'll highlight what's important. So we have the images um, uh, which created the depth image for our surroundings as an input. It went through this autoencoder and was represented in a latent space that was a, a way for the network to efficiently model what was important in the environment as you walked through that environment. And then we had our state. We had the odometry where you were walking and joint angles. And we went it through this LSTM, our long short-term memory, which is one of those recurrent networks. So it said, given everything that has happened up until now, how can I predict the next few sequences of what will happen conditioned on the past? Uh, and then using this, it produced how it expected your walking to evolve and how it expected your uh, environment or your latent state to evolve as well. And so we walked in different places around campus um, and we collected measures for uh, a, a prediction horizon of seven seconds on how well um, we could actually predict where you would end up. 
Um, and so what we learned is if you were indoors where it was kind of like tighter regions, it was actually um, uh, really good to predict within about two meters where you would end up. So uh, in these drawings, the red line is the average line, the solid line is the average line, and then the colored shaded area is the covariance associated with this. So the top row is indoor, the second row is um, outdoor cluttered, and the third row is outdoor free. Uh, and so what uh, the point I really want to drive home here is we could do a decent job of predicting where the person would go, but there was this variance. And this variance doesn't necessarily mean our model was wrong. It just means that perhaps there were many solutions that ultimately would occur. And if we only predicted one, um, we may not exactly be correct because there's this distribution that a person may walk that all would be valid choices. A really cool feature, and I encourage you to again, go check out this video, um, was actually the fact that we could do a decent job of predicting behavior in environments. So here's a picture inside of our psychology building. And um, with these sets of images, you'll notice on either side of the dashed line, there's on the top row, a vision model and a no vision model um, for time segments A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, if you look at the row for vision model, the blue line and its ellipses represent where you walked in the past and the sway covariance at those instances. The green line uh, represents where you actually ended up because we recorded all of that data um, and we then post-processed it to, to, uh, to do it when we then validated it. And the red line with its ellipses indicate where you predicted you would end up um, and where you, how you predicted the sway covariance of the person. And what you'll notice is if you don't use vision, um, the model just assumes inertia. It assumes if you're walking in a particular way, you're going to keep walking because that's all it has access to. But if you incorporate conditioning on the environment and past data of people walking, it begins to learn that it can't walk into walls, um, that there's likelihood of you turning down uh, walkways when it's available. And then given how you're orienting your body, you may walk in a particular way. And given your speed, you can predict how fast you'll walk in the future as well. Another really cool feature here was as you walk in particular environments, there was actually a correlation in your sway covariance um, as you walked in those zones. So here's a picture of my uh, graduate student. He's walking around campus. Uh, and what was interesting was when he took sharp turns, his sway covariance turned, uh, changed in a particular way. And after being exposed to that type of data, uh, the model was actually able to predict the motion of his torso given the path that he was going to walk. Um, and so again, these are some really cool videos I encourage you to check out. You can actually see in real time that motion of the torso as well as the uh, sway covariance as they walk through an environment. Some future directions for this. Well, we have that covariance that wasn't perfect. So what if we wanted to predict multiple trajectories? And uh, perhaps the sensor system that we showed you is not cool enough for people to wear. Uh, it would be better if it could perhaps be a smartphone. Uh, and then uh, down the line, we'd like to also actually help populations that could use this. So this could be uh, older populations or people with neurological disabilities. Could you outfit with them with this sensor, collect their data, and then make this system work for them? Uh, and perhaps use this also in lower limb exoskeleton control, which my lab is excited to collaborate with Professor Steve Collins here in the mechanical engineering department at Stanford as well. So we've implemented this on a smartphone. We're actually able to get really good uh, depth representation data. Um, my student is also trying to improve the ability to estimate sway covariance. Um, we have this software called 4D Humans that's able to extract the pose of the person. Um, and then we can actually monitor their sway as they walk. And then we can actually collect videos from the wild where we see instances where people fall, and we can learn if our parameter is actually useful in predicting whether those falls might occur. And finally, we're able to say, well, uh, given the fact that we might want to predict multiple paths and environments, we can use diffusion models to actually predict those uh, multiple hypothesis paths. So here, we use a segment anything framework from Facebook to actually partition uh, doors, walls, obstacles, ground, and then with this, watch the data where people walked, and then predict multiple hypotheses of where they may end up. So here you see two distributions of paths, some that lead through this doorway, others that make a turn, and both of those are um, actually uh, valuable outcomes. So the takeaway I want to leave you with today 
um, is that real world user human data can serve as a strong prior for teammate prediction through generative modeling and the ability to predict the teammate can lead to more effective collaboration. And I will end with that. Thank you very much. Professor Monroe, thanks so much. This is really interesting and a very insightful presentation. You and your lab are doing some really great work and um, it was really great to, to have you share that with, with the audience today. Um, now let's get into some questions. Bill, did you wanna kick us off? Um, and then I will take a look at what we have in the Q&A. Well, we've got, you know, we, we have a limited amount of time. So I, I think I'll just, I'll, I'll have one question, but let's let's jump into the Q&A. Uh, Monroe, you mentioned some things about, you know, fall detection or um, folks who have disabilities. Can you talk a little bit more about what your lab is doing um, with these predictive models that might be useful for folks that have either limited mobility or other, or other um, disabilities? Yeah, um, so two of the ones that I mentioned today <clears throat> particularly um, included like the intelligent prosthetic arm um, and the other, like the fall prevention sensor, which you just mentioned. Um, I think in both cases, the question that we're asking is one of intention estimation, right? They're either in the case of the intelligent prosthetic, the person does not have an ability and we want to endow them with that uh, ability, but they have the, uh, the ability to give us some sort of input. Um, but if you're trying to control these systems, the like the degrees of freedom that you need to control are so high and complex uh, that it's very difficult to extract that low level control from the person. So if we can right. bring robotic autonomy where a robot knows how to do a task um, and then couple that with clever ways of reading the person, right? Estimating their intent, then we can uh, uh, return hopefully some of that ability, some of that agency for them to do particular tasks. And in the case of of uh, the fall prevention sensor, this is augmentation. So we assume that the person is capable, but they could use some help to avoid some unfortunate outcomes. And this could again be in fall prevention or in like exoskeleton control. The idea here is you may not necessarily be replacing their ability, um, but your ability to predict and assess and predict risk um, becomes useful in protecting or helping these individuals. But it's just it's just fantastic, and the and, you know the, the I, I have a sense from your talk that we're right on the edge of some amazing you know new uh, capabilities, either to augment you know um, human capabilities or to replace things that for whatever reason age or or, uh, or disease or something has caused us to have a disability. Um, Annette, do you have some questions from the from the audience? I'm sure they are I, full of questions. <laughs> I do. There, there are a ton. So um, I will try to get as many as we can. But for for to kick us off, um, Mon Professor Monroe, as we progress towards machines understanding human intention, what pot potential positive and negative impacts could this have on society? And how can we ensure responsible and ethical development in this domain? It's a great question. Um, you know, I would start off with the sort of positive by really just emphasizing need. Um, I think to date, many times, you know, the conversation with robotics and robotic autonomy is concern around replacement. Um, but the goal of robotics is to improve human life. Um, and so that doesn't always necessarily mean a robot replacing a particular task. If the task is very dangerous for people and people are getting hurt or they're being mistreated, then perhaps a robot should be replacing those instances. Um, but if that's not the case, then maybe augmentation is the answer. How do we make people more efficient? Um, and so I think, you know, thinking about uh, examples in assisted living, you know, you could have robots that could work with um, people who want to live in their house longer. Um, maybe they have small issues with dexterity and other things, but they're uh, cognitively all there. And, you know, they could hopefully live on their own a little bit longer with the aging population worldwide. Having these types of systems that could help in that way would be extremely helpful. Um, and you can think of uh, other instances in agriculture, um, in terms of like, you know, helping with sustainable foods, having robots that could uh, work along farmers to achieve those things. Uh, you could think of the elderly population, as I mentioned, manufacturing, making sure that's humane, effective, while you know, not necessarily diminishing output, um, are all very good uh, potential um, outcomes. Um, you know. I think with as with every engineering tool, um, ethics is important and there are ways that these things could be potentially abused or misused. 
Um, one that immediately comes to mind, you know, is, um, you know, I think at some point we want to make sure that these solutions are democratized. They should be accessible to everybody. And so um, it would be great to say, you know, I have this robot that has all of these capabilities. I would love to say if I put this robot in an old, older person's home, maybe there's a flat rate uh, that they have for this. Um, and there should be a level of functionality that they should not be nickel and dimed for, you know. Oh, my robot can make tea, so you have to pay, you know, a subscription fee of ten dollars a month if you wanted to make tea for you. It, if it knows how to make tea, it should make the person tea. I think, you know, not uh, making sure that the fundamental skills of these systems are democratized, so that there's accessibility and usability, and that we, you know, stay on track for net positive effort. Um, again, I think, you know, these tools are very powerful. You know, even more fundamentally than the robots, the power of prediction is itself a very incredible thing. We predict the weather and it leads to, you know, um, us being able to protect ourselves, right? Um, but everything, you know, again, has the ability to be misused. So I think there is an idea of, you know, fundamentally thinking, right, you know, it is our responsibility to make sure that the solutions we develop are helping people and not harming them. Um, and at some level, you know, with every powerful tool, it does become on the honest of the developer to make sure that they're um, being used in responsible ways, and society to hold people accountable when they're not. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you so much for those insights. Um, I think we have time for about one more question. So um, I know you touched on this a little bit in the presentation, but one of our participants is interested in, in kind of expanding more around what role does artificial intelligence and machine learning play in advancing the field of human robot interaction, specifically in enabling machines to understand and adapt to diverse human intentions? That's a great question. So, um, you know, I think machine learning has, again, plays this really fundamental role of um, allowing us to model stochastic processes, right? Um, you know, if you put an input in and you expect a single output, that's an analytical description that can be very useful for things where the rules are very defined. Um, but, you know, data science is becoming very popular because the real world is often very hard to model um, and also very noisy. Um, however, there's a, a significant power of statistics, right, to be able to understand the distribution of particular outcomes. And uh, machine learning and AI is that tool that sits on those statistical principles in order to allow us to predict those events with high likelihood. Um, I think with that ability of prediction, with that ability to model things that are not analytical, we will see robots that are able to adapt to uncertainty in their environment, to adapt to variability that exists. Um, and with this ability to adapt, um, we'll see their utility spike in a very significant way. And with that, I think we'll see just improvement in human life as these physical embodied intelligent systems are able to improve the world we live in. Yeah, a very interesting time um, in, in life and I, very exciting. So. Thank you again so much, Professor Monroe. This is real. This was really interesting and insightful. Loved the conversation. To everyone in the audience with us live today, thank you for your questions and your participation. I want to remind you that today's session was recorded and a link will be sent out to you within a week. Um, please have a great rest of your day and I'll see everyone next time.